Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. We start out with a couple of television personages today, and we're going to start with Richard Dysart, who died recently at the age of 86. He was a stage actor who gravitated towards television. Here's how he tells it. I had stayed away from uh, television series. Most of my career was on the stage, Broadway, off-Broadway, repertory, theater around the country, and Moved out to the West Coast in 73 and was fortunate enough to be able to do feature films and television films. And I stayed away from the series and somewhere in the back of my mind, in the back of my professional feelings about it all, I, I saw I thought, well, someday a certain good part's going to come along in a series that's going to have a chance of, of making it for a few years. I just got to be available for that. That's what happened. I'm an extremely fortunate man. Well, the Wright series came along in the late 80s, early 90s, and it was L.A. Law with the familiar theme song. was a Stephen Bochco production. It was the star for David Kelly, who wrote a lot of the scripts. He was a lawyer in Boston before that. It was an essentially an ensemble show. It had some great actors in it, including Jimmy Smits, Harry Hamlin, Jill Eikenberry, Susan Day, Blair Underwood, and Corbin Burnson. Richard Dicer played Leland McKenzie, the head of a fictional L.A. law firm, McKenzie Brackman. He was the eminence grease on the show, and actually he was the eminence grease off the show. He advised a lot of the actors. Here he is in the opening episode discussing the death of one of the partners. I hardly know what to say regarding the untimely death of Norman Cheney, a good friend and respected colleague, except we greatly miss him. Plus which, his passing leaves a serious void in an extremely lucrative area in our practice. We can discuss that aspect later, Douglas. Fine. And what about the Lewis tax audit? Do you think either George Lewis or the IRS are going to say we can discuss that later? I said this is not the time. In any event, I spent the last 45 minutes going through Norman's personal papers and last instructions, simple cremation, with a memorial service preceding, at which those of you desiring may pay your last respects. Now, if you all do mind... Excuse me. Richard Dicer was a very good actor, but television is a writer's medium, and to his credit, he always acknowledged that L.A. Law was a writer's show. We're going to move on now to another television person, Richard Baer, who died recently at the age of 101. He was a writer-director, and he holds the record for directing the most successive numbers of a television show. He directed all 168 episodes of the great 1960s comedy Green Acres. We talked about Green Acres before. A lot of people think it's just a hayseed CBS comedy from the 60s, but in actuality, it was the first great meta TV show. It was surrealism at its best. Richard Baer directed Arnold Ziffel, the famous pig. Samuel L. Jackson talks about in Pulp Fiction. Here's a little bit of Arnold with his owner, Fred Ziffel. Look, why doesn't he go to Las Vegas with the five and see if he can run it up? Arnold doesn't gamble anymore since he lost all that money playing the horses. Playing the... This time, Mr. Ziffer is going to make him open up a bank account. Harry, are you the fellow that I talked to about opening an account? Yes, sir. Won't you come in? Sure. Thank you. Will you have a seat, please? Thank you. Your name, please? Ziffel. Fred Ziffel. Is that the way you want the account to read? No. I want it to read Arnold Ziffel. Arnold? My boy here. Oh, <laughs> we can't open an account for a pig. <laughs> oh, now, Arnold, don't get upset. Remember, I've told you that the world is full of prejudice. Come on, you gotta love that. How about a little Mr. Haney, played by Pat Buttram, discussing the new program, Medicare? Hello, oh, Mr. Haney. Hello, Mr. Haney. What are you doing here? Oh, I just stopped by to have my appendixes out. Why, do they bother you? No, but I figure what's the sense in having Medicare if you don't take advantage of it? That's ridiculous. Last week I had my tonsils out. Oh, for... What operation did you have? I didn't have any. You didn't have a free operation? No. Did you get any free medicine? No, we... Did you get the diathermy treatment? 
look, I, I hope you didn't pass up the liver x-ray. There's one episode where Mr. Haney is courting a woman, he turns on the television and says, oh, look, Gene Autry, I love watching him and his sidekick. Of course, Pat Buttram was Gene Autry's sidekick back in the movies. And who can forget one of the great screen couples in television history, Lucy and Desi on acid, Oliver and Lisa, Eddie Albert and Ava Gabor. If food means that much to you, maybe you better find somebody else. What? Well, when you married me, you knew that I couldn't cook, I couldn't sew, and I couldn't keep house. All I could do was talk Hungarian and do imitations of Zsa, Zsa Gabor. Yeah, imitations of Zsa, Zsa Gabor, her real-life sister. A couple of final trivia points on Richard Baer. He was married for a while to Phyllis Coates, who was the first Lois Lane on Superman on television. And he's the guy who discovered Jim Garr, whose podcast we did about a year ago. Cast him in a Warner Brothers television western, Cheyenne. The next day, when the dailies came in, Jack Warner wanted to see everybody, everything how Cheyenne was going along. And uh, all of the Clint Walker stuff was good. He said, well, I think we've got a star there. And he said, who's that fellow that just rode in on the horse? So Bill Orr says, well, that's uh, Jim Bumgarner. So Jack Warner says, well, take the bum out and give him a seven-year contract. That's how he became Jim Garner. We're going to move on now to our feature tonight, Gunter Grass, who died recently at the age of 87. He was the conscience of post-war Germany. One of the great novelists of the 20th century, a leftist intellectual. In 1959, he wrote The Tin Drum, one of the great books of the 20th century. A fictional story about a young boy from his own hometown of Danzig who gets caught up in the political whirlwind of the Nazis. In response, he decides not to grow up. His toy drum becomes a symbol of his refusal. It was made into a pretty good German movie in 1979. Here's a little bit from the interviewers at the BBC on the tin drum. There was once a drama who hated the world of grown-ups. I think that Günther Gass was the most important writer we had after the war because he was the great voice of Germany. There was once a gullible people who believed in Santa Claus. But in reality, Santa Claus was the gas man. He was a great narrator. He could tell wonderful stories. He was a very strongly political person. And he was everywhere. You, you opened a paper, there was Günther Gass talking about this or that. There was once a drama who screamed shattered glass. It took me a long time to find uh, the perspective to tell this wrong, wrong story. And I needed uh, a person who was not involved, like a boy, but inside like a grown-up person to understand everything. Also because this behavior of people in Germany in this time was the time to uh, people who were not really... Uh, Grown up, there's a, like, this childish reaction, this believing in everything. And this uh, was for me, uh, Oscar could be like a mirror to all the things who happened. Grass, who I met once many years ago, told me that fairy tales were the most important influence in his life. He always loved them. He thought that fairy tales had a great morality, had beautiful stories to tell. And they, of course, were talking about people, everyday people. So he used fairy tales quite often as symbols and as metaphors in his books. Thus, prematurely acquainted with feminine logic, I heard the following. When Oscar is three years old, we'll give him a tin drum. He gave voice to a holy upset and morally angry uh, young nation. You got Gunter Grass, who's a hero to all the literati all over the world, conscience of Germany, all that stuff. The problem is his reputation took a little bit of a hit in 2006 when he revealed a little fact that he concealed from the public for 60 years. He just happened to be part of the Waffen's SS at the end of World War II. I volunteered for active duty. When? Why? What I did cannot be put down to youthful folly. No pressure from above, nor did I feel the need to assuage a sense of guilt at, say, doubting the Fuhrer's infallibility by my zeal to volunteer. The way we 15-year-old boys saw it, our uniforms attracted all eyes. Rabidly pubescent, we considered ourselves the mainstays of the home front. So your conscience of Germany didn't tell you that he'd been part of one of Hitler's most vicious brigades during his late teenage years at the end of the war. All the literati and bien pensants didn't know how to respond to that. Here's a brief report from BBC News on Gunter Grass. Never far from his pipe, Gunter Grass was one of the 20th century's most recognizable, influential, and controversial figures. The novelist was a teenager when the 
the Second World War began. He was later credited with helping to revive German culture after the war and became the voice of a generation struggling with guilt over the country's Nazi past. I have always considered myself as a writer and a citizen. In 1999, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. When asked why his most famous novel, The Tin Drum, was such a success, he reportedly quipped, because it's a good book. And for Gunter Grass, there was, it seems, still so much more to say. When my end shall come, he once said, it will be over a nearly finished or just started work. I have to live with that. Here's part of the ceremony where they awarded him the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1999. Günther Grass, your sense of proportion has done mankind a genuine service. Your new book has the title Mein Jahrhundert, My Century. The fact that you are receiving the 20th century's last Nobel Literature Prize is confirmation of the reasonableness of such a title. In your cavalcade of the past hundred years, you give ample proof of your uncanny ability to impersonate the voices of the thoughtless, all those bewitched by the hopes of politics and technology, rendered stupid by the great perspective. The core of thoughtlessness is enthusiasm. I read my Jahrhundert as a critique of enthusiasm and a celebration of its opposite, good memory. Your style, with its repetitions and specifications and stratification of different voices, tells us that we shall not be in a hurry either when dealing with the past or when dealing with the future. You have shown that as long as literature remembers what people hasten to forget, it remains a power to be reckoned with. I would like to express the warm congratulations of the Swedish Academy as I now request you to receive the Nobel Prize for Literature from the hands of His Majesty the King. Of course, at that time, they didn't know that he was part of the Waffen SS, so I'm wondering if all those Swedish guys would have given him the prize if they'd known that. You can draw your own conclusions on that. We're going to move on now to Percy Sledge. Died recently at the age of 74. He was a one-hit wonder, but it was a big hit. It was number one in 1966. It was the first number one record from the Muscle Shoals Studios in Alabama, and it got him into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2005. When a man loves a woman. <laughs> number 53 on the Rolling Stone list of the 500 greatest songs of all time. Supposedly he wrote that song but he didn't get the royalties for it and it was played in a bunch of movies like Platoon and The Big Chill. And just for completeness sake we should listen to Michael Bowden's 1991 Inferior Remake. When a man loves a woman And keep his mind on nothing else He turned the world for the good things he's Sorry, Michael, not even close to Percy Sledge. A little Percy Sledge tribute for a while back in the 70s, Lee Atwater, the Republican operative who devised the Willie Horton strategy, played backup guitar for him. Go figure. I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. I might have closed with When a Man Loves a Woman by Percy Sledge, not Michael Bolton. But I had to mention Milton DeLug. He died at the age of 96, and he was an accordionist, a composer, and a band leader. Play the accordion for Al Jolson. That's how far back he goes. He's best known for being the band leader on The Tonight Show for Johnny Carson for a little while in the 60s. He was the guy in between Skitch Henderson and Doc Severinsen. And as I said, he was a songwriter and he wrote one big song. It was called Orange Colored Sky. It was a big hit in the 50s for Nat King Cole. But to expand our repertoire of closing artists and show my daughters I'm cool, we're going to close with Orange Colored Sky, sung by one of their favorite artists. So it was a final tribute to Milton DeLug. Here's the song he wrote. Orange Colored Sky, sung by Lady Gaga. This one's for you, Charlotte, and for you, Shana, too. I was walking along, bound in my business, without an orange colored sky. Flash, bam, valley for sale, wonderful you came by. I was home in a tune, drinking in sunshine, without an orange colored view.